Welcome back to Feminism Concepts and Theories and congratulations, you've made it to week two. So week one might have been quite a bit already, but it's only going to get more difficult, denser, but perhaps a little bit more interesting henceforth. So for weeks two, three and four, we're going to continue the work that we started in terms of feminist vocabulary, except now we are moving into questions of conceptualization and theory. Now, concepts and theories often form the building blocks of academic work as we know it, but they also do other very important functions in terms of understanding a large body of work like feminism. They establish commonalities between various people that are interested in the subject and between various people that want to continue to do research on the subject. Now, with feminism, as we may have already spoken about in the last week, there exists confusion between such kind of knowledge production and the idea of feminism as a movement. But as I have emphasized before and will continue to do so, there is a very, very strong relationship between the theories of feminism and the ways that feminism is effective on the ground. So to that extent, I'd like to proceed without so much of a clear differentiation. But in order to do that, in order to remove what might be a perfectly understandable fear of theory, let's start by talking about what is it that we mean by theory or by concepts or by conceptualization. To that extent, today's lecture, lecture five, the first for week two consists of speaking about conceptual literacy. And this might seem a little bit over the top because honestly, we are literate. We understand what literacy means in general terms. What do we mean by conceptual literacy? And why are we speaking about such even before we delve into feminism? Couple of reasons why and I'll get to it. But a caveat, I want you to deal with this lecture on its own. While it might feed into feminist theory and therefore my examples are very much from feminism, I also think about this particular set of teachings, theorizations as important to our understanding of academic research overall or academic work overall. So make of it what you will and certainly think about it in relation to feminist theory but also in relation to your own work in other bodies as well. Yes. So, without further ado, in this lecture, we are going to be utilizing one of our key texts, Key Concepts in Feminist Theory and Research as on the syllabus and we are dealing with one or two chapters to begin with and then we will move on to the questions that are there in the other chapters. So, today's chapters are about conceptual literacy and maybe a little bit of introduction to how this feeds into our next subject which is the question of equality. Now, conceptual literacy is covered in the text in the introductory chapter and in chapter one. So everything in this presentation that I'm speaking about today are extracts from chapter one. So you'll see a lot of block quotes, which I want to explain. And towards the end of the lecture, we will read from the text as well. But keep this chapter in mind as we go through the concepts. Conceptual literacy for our purposes consists of the following. We are very interested in the multiplicity of meanings that are invoked by the use of key terms. Now, we have already been through some key terms last week. If you remember, sex, gender, sisterhood, violence, marriage, structures, so on and so forth. Now we are going to take it to a different level and say, well, all of these key terms can mean multiple things. And therefore, in building a theory, how do we ever agree upon what somebody means when they say woman? Yeah. So hang on to that thought. The second thing we're going to work with is this question of the dualistic framing of language. And this might seem a little opaque to you right now but I will explain further as we go along. Three very, very important post-structuralism or the art of deconstruction, which is looking at something being used or deployed and deconstructing it, 
breaking it down to understand what are the ways in which it means something or it may mean other things. And lastly, this is very, very important to precisely what I was speaking about a few seconds ago, which is the salience of focusing on language in use. Just the way that we understand feminist theory as important to feminism deployed on the ground, we think about language for the purposes of this chapter as only having meaning when it is used in everyday and otherwise and not as an inert set of words and rules. And this is very, very important to our current discussion. As we go on with this chapter, you will discover why. Let's start with this question of woman itself. What does one think when somebody says woman? Now it depends on how it is invoked, what is the context, who is being spoken about, who is spoken to. But say for example, for the purpose of our current discussion, I say woman. What is the picture that comes to your mind? What is the idea that comes to your mind? It could be something as vague as a set of outlines, just a broad idea of what one understands by woman. It could be something very, very located and culturally specific, like one of Raja Ravi Varma's paintings of an ideal woman or a beautiful woman or a particular kind of idea of woman. Or it could be something even more contemporary and transnational and global, such as Gal Gadot's Wonder Woman, right? These are all possibilities of what one might think about when somebody says woman. This is what we mean by multiplicity of meanings. And this is, of course, understandable. Each term is a basket. It can constitute multiple sets of possibilities, and that's how we function in life. It depends on the context in which we use it that we understand its meaning. Here's the second problem. When I say woman, these kinds of figures are less likely to come to mind. Are you thinking about Lucy Walker, the alpinist, people that look like this, yes? And think about it. I'm not going to specify and make it easy for you by saying, what do I mean by this? But does Lucy Walker look to you like an ideal woman type? Think about why not. Or for example, the Rana Casta Semenya, who, if people are aware, has had many problems claiming the status of woman in international sport. These are less likely to come to mind. So therefore, much as we can claim that concepts evoke multiple meanings, they also have very clear limits in their meaning. And these limits are not merely about very, very clear exclusions. They're also about a perceived sense of who can or cannot be included in the category. And often the exclusions are arbitrary or based upon prejudices rather than located in clear definitions of the concept itself. Thereby, we begin to see why is it that conceptualization is a bit of a mixed game. You know that you need it for specificity, you know that you need it for precision, but you also know that it encompasses assumptions, prejudices and biases. Therefore, theoretically, we have to be very, very careful. Coming to the question of why theory then? If theory is something that is a minefield, why is it that one speaks about theory? How does one relate to theory? And in this, I return to the question of concepts and categories. We have concepts within which you have particular ideas of the world. The world is organized through concepts. Concepts of, say, happiness, concepts of sorrow, concepts of gender. These are broad understandings of the world within which we organize meaning. And each of these organizations is also a category. And as many theorists will tell you, categories are not innocent beings. They include certain things, they exclude other things. And by understanding the measures through which inclusion and exclusion happens, we begin to see the ways in which the world operates and these ways are not innocent. I'll come to what that means when I come to the question of dualism in construction, but hold on to that thought. You remember this part which we discussed prior to Hooks? Sex is the term that is used when referring to woman as a biologically sexed body and gender is the term that denotes the socially produced meanings of woman. 
We also discussed how while this is considered to be fixed, this is mutable and such social production depends on the historical and cultural location of gender and the ways in which we speak about it in that time and place. I also mentioned a little while ago that sex itself has come to be contested and to be similarly historically and culturally located but for the purpose of simplicity we will hang on to this distinction now. But even within this if we say that gender is something that is meaningful only in a time and place then can it actually have fixity of meaning is a question you have to grapple with when you are producing theory about feminism and about women. We come to this question of why soon. Therefore, in order to understand this idea of social production, deconstruction and through dualism. Now, dualism is something that is inherent to how we understand the construction of language and this is a post-structural understanding of language just for our purposes, let me briefly mention that post-structural theory has got to do with the fact that categorizations, ways in which meaning is organized in language is considered to be not innocent and is considered to reveal to us something about how power operates. In other words, in a language, if there are ways in which the relationship of one to the other is determined, that relationship also is undergirded by structures of power. Let me speak a little bit more and then you'll know what I'm on about. A dualism is an intense, established and developed cultural expression of such a hierarchical relationship, constructing central cultural concepts and identities so as to make equality and mutuality literally unthinkable. This question of unthinkability and the question of language is very related to the Susorian idea of linguistics which is that the world is constructed only through the language that we speak. Meaning language both provides the world that you understand and prevents you from understanding the world in any other way. If you speak that language, whatever tools the language gives you, gives you a capacity for living in the world. You don't understand anything outside of it. Therefore, in language, if this idea of dualism is correct, that there are ways in which words are related to each other that are not innocent, the question of opposites always means that one has more power and the other has lesser power and one sees this relationship as almost natural, it means that you will never have the possibility of thinking about equality. There will always be a power relationship within which your world is defined. Here are a couple of examples. Culture and nature, reason and nature, male and female, mind and body, reason and emotion, reason and matter, public and private, subject and object, self and other. Right? Now in this, how do you understand this? Which is it that's the weaker, that's the stronger? Do we accord a view of the world in which everything has its place and therefore it doesn't matter? Look closer. Culture and nature, which is considered to be superior in our current world, often culture. Culture is what one makes of nature. Nature is given to you. It is untamed, it is wild, it is unpredictable, but culture tames nature. Culture is the one that has the capacity for power. Similarly, reason and nature, where reason stands in for culture and ever since enlightenment, there has been the understanding, a so-called understanding that Reason triumphs. Only reason can allow us to comprehend the world and any kind of understanding that nature provides is unmediated, does not have meaning, is amenable only to those who are superstitious or take nature at face value. Likewise for male and female, where you can begin to see that male stands in for reason, female stands in for nature. The male is the one that has reason and rationality. 
The female is the one that is hysterical, has emotion in excess of what is required to function in everyday life, provides care but cannot be trusted to take decisions when it matters in terms of serious issues. Mind and body. Again, mind is to culture, body is to nature. Body is what is given, mind is what controls it. And this has been true since the Cartesian, I think, therefore I am. The mind is what controls the body. The body does not have a will or possibility of its own. Left to its own devices, it will perish or go wild, which is not, which is not ideal in this understanding. Similarly, reason and emotion, reason, matter, public, private, subject, object, self and other. A self and other is a binary that is very, very important to social sciences research on the whole. It is only self that is always important and at the center of the narrative. The other is that which cannot be understood and must always be either tamed or civilized or explained or controlled. And the other is always the one without power. Therefore, at the end of this, we ask the question, how is truth produced? How does language frame meaning? Think about what that means. When we say that language frames meaning, we are suddenly taking language out of what is commonly understood as its descriptive potential. Here's a screen. Therefore, language just looks at it and says this is a screen. Whereas in our understanding, we are saying language produces the screen. It's only through language that we understand that a screen exists. And therefore, language always frames meaning. Meaning is wild, untamed, all over the place. Language gives us a frame to be able to see it in a particular fashion. And it's only through language and it's only through understanding its mechanisms that we can free meaning from its hierarchical connotations, from the ways in which it seems to naturally produce hierarchical relationships where one is more powerful, one is less powerful and we cannot imagine equality. To bring it back to the mandate of feminist theory, therefore, we need to understand language and the ways in which it functions in order to produce the possibility of an equal society. Here we are going to the heart of theoretical work. Theoretical work must imagine language differently, must tweak it differently in order for us to think differently about gender in the world. If we are to destabilize the ways in which gender operates as an axis of difference, where one thing is considered to be naturally higher up, men, and on the other end is everybody that is not a man, then we have to find different ways of organizing the spectrum and taking away its hierarchical meaning. Let's then bring it down to this question of the man-woman binary, which is what we are seeking to deconstruct. And by this understanding of language, we argue that the appearance of fixity in the man-woman binary is maintained through the suppression of its opposite. Meaning, how do we understand man? As not woman. Likewise, how do we understand woman? As not man. And this is all that is required in order for the world to seem as if it's a natural organization of men and women where we don't quite know exactly what each means. We'll come to this problem later in relation to organizing or the feminist movement as an activist movement. But for now, stick with this. The notion of an array of deferred meanings is often summarized in terms of Derrida's conceptualization of difference. Difference just means that every time you accord meaning to something, what it is not is deferred. You're constantly speaking about something that is in relation to what it is not. And therefore, what it is, is a deferred meaning. It's always put away for the future when something else will come to light and then we'll say, oh, but it's not that either. 
you're constantly defining something in terms of what it does not mean and not in terms of what it means and therefore language itself provides slippery definitions there is always a lack at the heart of meaning and this embodies relations of power within language as to what it is that it can get away with keep these in mind in relation to the man woman binary and therefore now we come to the crux of the problem in relation to feminist theory which is if woman is not a unified whole by these very definitions woman is that which is not man what it is is not very clear and it can hold multiple kinds of meanings it's a process it's fragmented it's in flux it's multiple so if a woman ceases to exist then what are we fighting for it's so easy to say well you know rights of women but if post structural theory then comes back with but there is no woman then who is it that the fight is for and how is it that we reconcile this non fixity of meaning and the need to mobilize and say that the experiences of women are common experiences that we must be able to speak about and visibilize remember the idea of women studies which is to make visible the experiences of women that were hitherto unavailable now if this form of theorizing is intent upon attacking the idea of fixity then how do we mobilize and what do we do with this this question i want you to bracket and keep in mind as we go forward because this kind of definition is necessary but at the same time does not quite get at what do we do in a feminist movement so keep these things in mind i know i am burdening you with a lot but the clearer we get about these the better it will be for you during the rest of this class and we'll keep returning to these throughout the course over the next few weeks let me just remind you however that the non fixity of meaning does not mean that language does not manage to do things with it even in its non fixed form the effort of language is also to fix it within certain set areas of meaning there are boundaries to concepts which language draws through relations of power and in order to understand that let me go to the next important term which is let me go to the next important term which is discourse what is discourse and from the text pay attention to these these are long and may seem difficult but they are perfectly intuitive finlays and defines discourse as referring both to the way in which language systematically organizes concepts knowledge and experience and to the way in which it excludes alternative forms of organization that's the boundaries between language social action knowledge and power are blurred very very clearly language has both productive it produces something it organizes concepts knowledge and experience through language we understand these things and to the ways in which it excludes alternative forms of organization which means it is also repressive remember the ways in which we spoke about difference it has to do both at the same time it has to tell you the ways in which something means something it also tells you the ways in which it does not mean other things masculine does not mean feminine feminine does not mean masculine and despite the multiplicity of meanings that each term evokes you want to think that there is no slippage or overlap thus the boundaries between language social action knowledge and power are blurred now this might seem a little bit much to you how is it that it's doing so many things but if you keep in mind the productive and repressive aspects of language you know that it allows only for certain kinds of action to be taken when certain things are spoken come to it in a bit this is also very very important to remember which is that this part of discourse or language was first employed in many ways historian of the systems of thought foucault for example comments that all manifest discourse is secretly based on an already said and this already said is not merely a phrase that has already been spoken or a text that has already been written but a never said 
an incorporeal discourse, a voice as silent as a breath, a writing that is merely the hollow of its own mark. Beautiful language. I would encourage you to read it again. Not merely a phrase that has already been spoken or a text that has already been written, but a never said, an incorporeal discourse, a voice as silent as a breath, a writing that is merely a hollow of its own mark. Now, all of this extremely beautiful imagery means something fairly profound. It means that when we say things, when language produces things, you already know that the things that it excludes have never been said. Language presents itself as if the truth presents itself without any mediation. To say a man means that a woman has never been said. To say a woman means that the possibility of man was never even there and that's why a woman. Each of these words obscures their own histories of coming into being and that is the nature of discourse. Discourse is powerful. It produces something as if it has already been there and as if what is not there not only cannot be spoken about but has never been spoken about. Keep these in mind. Discourse is difficult but it's important. And therefore, to philosophers like Wittgenstein, language is very, very important in the wake of all of these because of the ways in which it produces language games. Wittgenstein imagines language as only making sense in use and when in use, it's not that systems of power are all powerful and you can only do one thing with it. You can play with language. This is the faculty that's been given to all of us that are fluent in one or more languages, which is because of the multiplicity of meaning, because of the ways in which there is slippage between meanings depending on the context in which the word is deployed, you can do many fun things with it. In relation to language games, please remember four important things. Language makes meaning only when in use. Words can do different things in different speech acts, where speech is not merely the indication that one must act. Speaking itself is the act. Speaking produces the act even before the act is acted out. Not just a system of signs with meaning. It means meaning is actively produced. The language itself is the meaning. But most importantly, language games produce the everyday as a place of struggle over meaning. There are contestations, there are conflicts and language can be deployed in an artful fashion in order to mean one thing rather than the other. Let me give you an example of something like this. Imagine somebody pronouncing, she is a child. Multiple ways in which this can mean things. Is it literal? Child as a category may not have universal agreement. So, somebody could be pointing to a person and saying, she is a child. This could be a rebuke. This could be an excuse. This could be a plea. You have to know the context to understand what it is. But even if it were just literal, just a description, what does one mean by child is a category that is not common across the world. It depends on where you are speaking about this category of the child. Is it somebody below 10 years of age, below 5 years of age, below 3 years of age, between 10 and 15, pre-tween, teen, multiple categories within which this can make meaning and not all of them will mean the same kind of person. If you think about it as a metaphor, then one might mean a person who is just like a child. Now, what is this like a child? What are the ways in which the overlap might be apparent? Is that person really innocent? Is that person really naive? Is that person really ignorant? Is that person really petulant or what they call childish? You don't know any of these things, but depending on what is the outcome that you want from that language game, you can deploy it differently depending on the context. This is what we mean by language games. Language games are both interesting and interesting possibilities for bringing about change in the world is one of the things that this chapter is arguing. 
Next, let's look at this question of words and speech acts where the speech itself is the act. Think about adages like behind every successful man, there is a woman. Think about the ways in which a statement like this accords places to men and women in the world. Here, the only people capable of being successful are men. Here, there is a seeming role for the woman too, as long as she is behind the man and has a hand in his success. Therefore, positionally, even though seemingly the woman is being given a compliment, she is confined to a place behind the successful man in an invisible space. Think about something like this, he to command and she to obey. I've heard this said so many times by older members of my family. Sometimes in irony, sometimes in jest, sometimes very, very seriously. Depending on what kind of tone is being deployed, the speech act can do different things. It could be said in sorrow, that somebody is thinking that this is not happening, but at least let me say it in speech. It could mean a certain kind of dictum towards telling somebody how to behave. It could be a general idea of what one person thinks are the appropriate spaces for men and women in the world. They know not what they do where you're talking about a random set of seemingly ignorant people. And it can mean so many things, but it establishes two things. The speaker knows those that are spoken about do not know and act in a way that is not appropriate, that is not helpful, that is not something that the speaker approves of. And lastly, well-behaved women seldom make history. Now, this is an effort through a language game to turn around this kind of hierarchical position of women in the world, where women are expected to be well-behaved, to be rewarded if they stick to the status quo. And here the speech act says they seldom make history. Only by going away from traditional understandings of what a woman should be, can a woman have a place in the historical record. And I don't mean to suggest that I'm for or against any of these. I'm merely demonstrating to you what each of these can do as a speech act. Here also is my favorite example of what one can consider when we speak about language as having meaning only in use. What I have for you on this screen are a set of taboo cue cards. For anybody who's played taboo, it consists of two teams where one team has to look at the card look at the main word over there and have the other team guess it without using any of these words, right? So if I want to say apple, I have to tell somebody, I can't say it's a fruit because that's on the list. I cannot say it's sweet. I cannot say it's green. I cannot say eat. I can, however, say this is the object by way of which Adam tempted Eve. No, the other way around. This is the object by virtue of which Eve tempted Adam. Hopefully somebody will come up with Apple, but think about the ways in which the language resources I'm drawing upon are already partaking of a resource in which the woman is portrayed as cunning, the man is portrayed as innocent and subject to trickery, but he is the one that is more virtuous. It's only because he was strict that we see the fall of man in biblical history. Think also of a word like lunch. I cannot say eat, I cannot say breakfast, dinner, food. What if I say what your mother cooks for you to take to school? I'll say lunch. Here again, I've resorted to a particular kind of narrative where the woman cooks for the children and this is part of the role that she has in home life. You get the drift. It might be, it's accidental quite that I picked on these narratives that are demonstrating certain kinds of organizations of male and female, but try it for yourself. And this will demonstrate to you that Apple, land, geography, all of these only have meaning in use and by looking at it the other way around, it becomes quite apparent. The last is, I think, one of the most important lessons of this chapter, that the everyday is a struggle over meaning 
through language we can fight this fight there are ways in which we deploy language against certain sets of meanings much as we then allow for language to take over our world of meaning itself and comply with it think about statements like stop behaving like a child where it's assumed that you understand what children behave like and you as an adult should not behave like it children are meant to be seen and not heard children are supposed to be quiet they have appropriate codes of behavior in public space and this is considered a certain kind of rebuke can't you be more feminine ostensibly said to a woman don't cry like a woman ostensibly said to be a can't you be more feminine ostensibly said to a woman don't cry like a woman ostensibly said to a man these are everyday terms but at the same time one can contest these and say things like boys also cry feminine is a particular set of attributes that not all women need to conform to because if femininity is constructed through gender through codes that are cultural and specific then one must have the freedom to behave differently and therefore the everyday is always a struggle over meaning as long as we are able to deconstruct meaning as long as we are able to understand what something says even though it seems straightforward one of my favorite one of my favorite exercises is also to look at daily headlines and look at what is it that they are trying to say when they say certain things random selection for today russia won't deny hackers leak jeremy corbyn's nhs documents now i'm not too sure what they mean by won't deny does it mean they will agree does it mean that they're actively giving away this information or does it mean that when confronted with this they don't have enough evidence to deny it think about it Supreme Court to consider according hearing in January on plea seeking stay on electoral bond scheme. This is the kind of headline that pretty much says nothing. It says consider according hearing. Now a consideration in the near future, January, does not mean that it will be accorded. It just means that it's ongoing and therefore it is in my understanding a pretty non-headline. I was also looking at an essay that spoke about precisely this about how headlines shape your perception of what's happening in the world around you and the author was saying that depending on whether the essay was titled headlines matter or misleading headlines can lead you astray your understanding of the news will be shaped differently think about this put it together in relation to everything that we have spoken about today I will briefly now read a few excerpts from the introduction and from the first chapter so you can understand how to focus your attention. I would suggest going back to this lecture to hear it as we go through the text.